Cam here from Xano Support, and today we're going to be going over higher order filters. We're going to be looking at the context variables and understanding them. We're also going to look over all of the filters and figure out how we can integrate them for our use cases. JavaScript can be a little intimidating, especially in a no-code environment, but once you learn it, you won't ever go back. Let's go ahead and speed up your workflows, and this is how you do it. Inside the Lambda uh, examples map function here that I've created, it's pretty simple. We're querying our records from the product data table and we're just updating them. Now we haven't updated them yet, but on the right hand side, we do have the data and how it comes back. So here's an array of 100 items. Here are our records. In our second step, when we are going to add this filter, we'll click on this add filter and we'll type in map. Or you can click on the array category and it brings you to the map. Now, we had just taken a look at the expected data. With this map filter, we are going to have the ability to manipulate this data in whichever way that we want. Map filter specifically is going to take in this list. And what we're going to do, and with what higher order filters will do, is for each item within this array, we are going to do something. So that's what happens here in this code input. In our timeout input, we basically say if the code's been going on, if we've been executing it for greater than this time, go ahead and just close it out, cancel it out entirely. But for our code, this is where the magic happens. We have the ability, so for each item, we'll go ahead and return something. We're going to send that item back into the array with this return statement. Now, I was saying that within this, uh, this array, it happened, like each item, we're iterating over each item and doing something with it. Now we have these things called context variables. Each item has a context variable. We have our this context variable. So this represents the item being iterated over. So just a regular record, like the ones we had just taken a look at. Then we have our parent. The parent is the array. That's all 100 items. And so if we run this code, which we will, we'll return for each item the this item or itself within the this key value, as well as the entire array and the parent key value. And lastly, we have our index. Our index is, well, the index of the loops, and in which case, you know, the item that we're currently looping over in this filter. So what this code is doing is it's going to be accepting an individual item or what and that object, basically those objects we had just seen, it's going to be taking one of them. And what we're saying, go ahead and change its data. Return us this new object with these key value pairs. Let's go ahead and run this. We'll save it real quick. And we can see that we now have the this key with the value of this, the item. We have the parents with the key of or the key of parent and the value of all 100 items in the array. And then the index, so zero in this case, because it's the first one. As we move down to the second, it's index one, so on and so forth, all the way till index 99. So within this map, you can see you can do anything with the data. You also have the ability to access the data within the con uh, context variable. So as an example, I'll create an object called price. And we'll go ahead and create a key value pair inside of it called price. And we'll say it's this dot price. So you can see we're using dot notation just like we would within Xano itself. So familiar syntax. We'll click save. We'll click rerun. And it will return us everything yet again. But now you can see I've returned the price. So we have ultimate manipulation with this map. We have the ability for each item to run complicated or even more complicated, whatever you want in this case, business logic within this code block here. So we don't have to just manipulate the data by saying, take this context variable. We can say, or set up conditions and if statements all within here for each particular item and then return a value. So this is the map statement. We're not going to move on to the next one. Now we're going to take a look at the sum higher order filter. We're still dealing with the same data. We're going to get inside our add filter. We'll add a sum filter. This is going to take a look and return a true or false if at least one item matches the condition that we are passing. 
we're going to return the evaluation, which is we're checking if this dot category equals smartphones. So I'm just going to loop through all 100 items. And the moment it detects an item where the category equals smartphones, it's going to return a true. Otherwise, it will turn a false here. We'll go ahead and click save and rerun this. And you can see it returns a true. If I go ahead and disable that, you can see just taking a look at the very first bit here, the category, we do have smartphones. We can do more here, but let's actually do one that doesn't exist. So let's say smartphone. There is no smartphone. There's only smartphone. So it returns a false statement. It runs through all 100 records and returns us a false statement. We then use this within the rest of our function stack. We're now dealing with the Lambda every filter. We're still dealing with the same data. The every filter, unlike the sum, is going to check if every item in the argument we're passing is true or false. And if one item isn't matching or satisfying the argument, it returns a false. If all of the items that it iterates over do satisfy the argument, it will return a true. So what we want to check is, let's say this dot price. And we'll check if it's greater than zero. We should expect a true response here. Because every price that we have that it's looped over is greater than zero. But is it greater than 50? Is every single price greater than 50? The answer here would be false. You can also continue to use this Boolean response in the rest of your function stack. Now we're going to move on to the find filter. The find filter is good at finding the first item within an array that matches or satisfies the argument that we're passing. So in this case, we'll add a find and we'll ask it to return. Oops. We'll ask it to turn uh, the first item where the price is greater than 20. Go ahead and run that. The first item that's price is greater than 20. Why would you be the first item? Let's go ahead and uh, change this to 550. So the first item is greater than 550 happens to be item number two at the price of 899. Is there anything more expensive than that? The first item that's greater than 899 happens to be <laughs> ID number three. So it seems like the most expensive items are probably at the start. We can go ahead and do one additional thing. How about if we check uh, the first item? Where the discount percentage is greater than 25. Is there an item like that? Does it exist? If it doesn't exist, it returns us just a null value. So it's good at finding things. And in this case, if it doesn't find it, it just returns us a null value. The find index is very similar to the find, but it's just finding the index of that item that we're looking for. So in this case, we'll apply the find index by clicking that add filter. And within our code, we'll say return the item where the this stock is greater than 10. And actually, this has a greater than 10. Can we do greater than 94? It looks like index three or item four in this case. So if we disable our filter, just run it real quick. Item four happens to have a stock of greater than that. So 123. So you can see the find index is helpful for finding the index of an argument or of an item that satisfies that argument. Now we're going to be moving on to the filter. The higher order filter of filter is by far my favorite and most used higher order filter. It allows me to take the array of data and to manipulate it without having to query it for my database with these constraints. So I have my code and I have arguments and I say, I want to filter out items that don't have this value versus others. And then a new array is returned. In this case, what I'd like to do is I'd like to show how it works, but by introducing a variable from our input field. I want to include a new input. It's going to be an integer by the name of price. In my product, I'll update this with my filter array and inside my code, I'll return. Let's say I want to return each item where the price is greater than dollar sign input 
dot price. So we're saying in this code, I want all of my items to be greater than my input value. And that input value, again, is our input. This is our new context variable. And then dot its name. We'll go ahead and run this here. When we run it at a price of zero, there are 100 items still. How many are greater than 50? We have 40 items. So with this filter, we have the ability to take our data and manipulate it within our function stack and filter it after it's been queried. So if we were creating a variable instead of updating a variable, we'd be able to create as many different variables of the original product underscore one and filter it however which way we want and use it within our function stack. The filter is by far my favorite and I use it the most. And I hope that with the inclusion of the input variable, this unlocks a world of possibilities for you. Last but not least, we have our reduce filter. Our reduce filter is going to take an entire array and reduce it into one data point. The way that this reduce filter is going to work is it's going to hold sort of like a running sum or running total uh, in a result variable. So this is a new context variable called result. It starts typically at zero, but you could of course set this to what you want. Within our code, we get to interact with it. So here we'll return, we'll say for each price, we'll add this to our result. And what this is going to do is it's going to take us, or it's going to go ahead and return us the total value or the total price for one item of each product. It comes to $20,456. Now, we also have the ability to, if we introduce a little bit of math here, can multiply, let's say, this uh, stock. So what we're going to say is, we're going to get all of the items for this particular item. We're going to multiply that by the price. So we'll get the total cost value for all of the items in inventory, and we'll add it as a running sum here. That means you can go ahead and buy each item in our inventory for $1,632,243. Now, of course, you might want to have a little fun and say, well, I don't want items that are under $50. So how do we go ahead and do that? Well, we can introduce a filter. We'll go ahead and see here. We'll go ahead and return. Uh, this will be our return. This dot price is greater than 50. And of course, you can always add an input here. Now, once I've added this filter, I am going to drag it above. But now I'm going to be able to filter out the items that I'm reducing. So you can see you can stack these Lambda filters. and now I've changed that value. If we want a clear demonstration of just well, how uh, that price changes here, we'll go ahead and just simply add our input, input.price. That's the dude. And we'll go ahead and say uh, 500. Items greater than 500. Turns out you'll still need quite the, uh, the wallet here. Now, if we go ahead and say items greater than 1,000, the number comes down a little bit. You can see the quantity starts to add up. But there you go. Those are all of our higher order filters. Hope that this video overview of our higher order filters was able to shine some light on how you can supercharge your workflows and your function stacks from a beginner to maybe something a little bit more advanced with JavaScript. It unlocks a world of possibilities with just a couple lines of code. If you have any questions, leave them in the comment section down below. If you want to download our snippet, it is in the description. And you can also reach out to us through the support chat or through the Xano community. Otherwise, see you next time.